As the painter looked at the gracious and comely form he had so skillfully mirrored in his art, a smile of pleasure passed across his face and seemed about to linger there. But he suddenly started up and, closing his eyes, placed his fingers upon the lids, as though he sought to imprison within his brain some curious dream from which he feared he might awake. It is your best work, Basil, the best thing you've ever done, said Lord Henry languidly. You must certainly send it next year to Grosvenor. The academy is too large and too vulgar. Whenever I've gone there, there have been either so many people that I have not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that I have not been able to see the people, which was worse. The Grosvenor is really the only place. I don't think I shall send it anywhere, he answered tossing his head back in that odd way that used to make his friends laugh at him at Oxford. No, I won't send it anywhere. Lord Henry elevated his eyebrows and looked at him in amazement through the thin blue wreaths of smoke that circled up in such fanciful whirls from his heavy opium-tainted cigarette. Not to send it anywhere? My dear fellow, why? Have you any reason? What odd chaps you painters are. You'd do anything in the world to gain a reputation. As soon as you have one, you seem you want to throw it away. It is silly of you, for there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. A portrait like this would set you far above all the young men in England and make the old men quite jealous, if old men are ever capable of any emotion. I know you will laugh at me, he replied, but I really can't exhibit it. I have put too much of myself into it. Lord Henry stretched himself out on the divan and laughed. <laughs> yes, I knew you would, but it is quite true all the same. Too much of yourself in it? Upon my word, Basil, I didn't know you were so vain, and I really can't see any resemblance between you, with your rugged strong face and your coal black hair, and this young Adonis, who looks as if he was made out of ivory and rose leaves. Why, my dear Basil, he is a narcissus, and you, well, of course you have an intellectual expression and all that. But beauty, real beauty, ends where an intellectual expression begins. Intellect is in itself a mode of exaggeration and destroys the harmony of any face. The moment one sits down to think, one becomes all nose or all forehead or something horrid. Look at the successful men in any of the learned professions. How perfectly hideous they are. Except, of course, in the church. But then in the church, they don't think. A bishop keeps on saying at the age of 80 what he was told to say when he was a boy of 18. And as a natural consequence, he always looks absolutely delightful. Your mysterious young friend, whose name you have never told me, but whose picture really fascinates me, never thinks. He is some brainless, beautiful creature who should be always here in winter when we have no flowers to look at, and always here in summer when we want something to chill our intelligence. Don't flatter yourself, Basil. You are not in the least like him. You don't understand me, Harry, answered the artist. Of course I'm not like him. I know that perfectly well. Indeed, I should be sorry to look like him. You shrug your shoulders. I'm telling you the truth. There is a fatality all about physical and intellectual distinction. The sort of fatality that seems to dog throughout history the faltering steps of kings. It is better not to be different from one's fellows. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. They can sit at their ease and gape at the play. If they know nothing of victory, they are at least spared the knowledge of defeat. They live as we all should live, undisturbed, indifferent, and without disquiet. They neither bring ruin upon others nor ever receive it from alien hands. Your rank and wealth, Harry, my brains, such as they are, my art, whatever it may be worth, Dorian Gray's good looks, we shall all suffer for what the gods have given us. Suffer terribly. Dorian Gray? Is that his name? Asked Lord Henry, walking across the studio towards Basil Howard. Yes, that is his name. I didn't intend to tell you. But why not? Oh, I can't explain. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It's like surrendering a part of them. I have grown to love secrecy. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvellous to us. The commonest thing is delightful if one only hides it. When I leave town now, I never tell my people where I'm going. If I did, I would lose all my pleasure. 
It's a silly habit, I dare say. But somehow, it seems to bring a great deal of romance into one's life. I suppose you think me awfully foolish about it. Not at all, answered Lord Henry. Not at all, my dear Basil. You seem to forget that I am married, and the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. When we meet, we do meet occasionally. When we dine out together or go down to the Dukes, we tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is very good at it, much better, in fact, than I am. She never gets confused over her dates, and I always do. But when she does find me out, she makes no row at it. I sometimes wish she would, but she merely laughs at me.